Well, it's that magical time of year again. The Randox Grand National just around the corner, and I'm joined by Phil Turner, time from Chase Handicap, a man who knows more about the great race than most people have forgotten. It's just... Phil, what makes this so special? What is it about the Grand National that really floats people's boat? Well, it's... It's, it's hard to sort of put it on one sort of single thing. I think it's a variety of reasons why it's sort of... We were discussing earlier that the, the, the Melbourne Cup is known as the race which stops a nation in Australia. Well, that's the closest thing we've got over here. I'm not saying everyone's obsessed with the Grand National, but you know they, they, they know it's going on normally, more so than any other race. And we can be, we're racing purists. We, we sort of might like, you know, Cheltenham just gone. But for the, the general public, this is the race. It's our, you know, our main shot window. And that can be a double-edged sword when we get bad news stories, well, the good news stories. But I think it's been going now for since the early 1800s and uh, it's here to stay for you know in terms of popularity anyway let's break it down category is what make it special number one has got to be horses and one in particular yeah well i mean the greatest grand national horse is red rum i think he's, he's the sort of the, the way to start and uh i mean we've just been talking about uh cheltenham we've had two potential superstars there in constitution hill and gallop de champ and in the last 15 20 years you've had corto star sprinter sacker on the flat frankel the average man in the street won't know who these horses are. We're, we're, we're all waxing lyrical about them. 1970s, 1980s, you ask them who Red Rum is, every single person would have known who he was. He's by far the most popular horse, certainly in my lifetime, this country's probably ever going to produce. I mean, even when he died, he got more column inches in his obituary than a, a former prime minister who died that month as well. It's like, it's unreal the level of sort of the way he sort of got into the national consciousness. And it was a remarkable, you know, his, his record, stands up to close inspection he ran five times in the race won it three times second twice and the other key point he played a very pivotal part in keeping the race going because for a, a lengthy period from sort of the early sort of the mid 60s through to the early 80s the race was in serious doubt of, of, of closing because Aintree was under threat of, um, from the developers um, and it wasn't an idle threat either. There were several times during that period where it was odds on that it was probably going to go. And certainly in 1975, um, Bill Davis, who bought the yard, he'd been thwarted in some of his plans and it looked like it was going to go. And it was only saved in the early 80s. So the fact, right in the middle of this period, you've got a horse who said the, the, the biggest advert for keeping the Grand National going is, is Red Rum. It, it's, it's not poetic license to say he played a big part in saving the race. How good was he? Aintree specialist? etc et was he a really talented racehorse he was a very good racehorse it was really only latterly where you could say that um he reserved his best for entry i think some some modern fans might think oh he's, they might view him a bit like a cross-country specialist no he could do it away from there um in his, in his five grand nationals he, he took on three gold cup winners two champion chase winners plus a whole host of the high class horses he was doing it against good horses in 1974 which i think was his his best win, that's Red Room, his absolute peak, his second win. He beat a dual goal cup, cup winner, giving him one pound in Lascargo, um, with a whole other host of other good horses in behind. And then two weeks later, I think it was, he went on to carry top weight and won the Scottish Grand National, winning six races that season, the season after he won a, goal, a, a, a Grand National. And the form he showed would have been good enough to see him placed in that year's Cheltenham Gold Cup. Now, it might not have tallied because it might not have been necessarily this, the same scenario for him, a bit like Noble Gates in this year's uh, Gold Cup. He might have got outpaced and stayed on late. But in terms of level of form, he was a top-class chaser. Point two we're going to make. Aintree's long running and the close finishes. Red Rum involved in the most famous of all in 70. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the punishing uh, long running, is it 494 yards? The most heartbreaking one is the 1973 Grand National where Red Rum played the role of the villain. He caught poor old Crisp who'd led all that way and, and, and got collared late on. And uh, if Betfair had been around in those days, I, I wonder what carnage would have ensued. Yeah, it, it's, it's thrown up a whole host of sort of big finishes. And, we, and we've had two really great photo finishes in recent years. And Tiger Roll's first Grand National win in 2018, he was actually playing the role of Crisp. He was the leader, seemed to have everything under control, and he was nearly caught on the line. And like literally another half stride, Pleasant Company would have been ahead of him. And you just think, with the Tiger Roll story, it would have been very different. If that, just that one half stride, it could have been a very different story. A remarkable horse, but would he be viewed as in the same way, you know, without that hanging on to that first win? And Daryl Jacob, a great piece on Sporting Life, please read it, how I won the National on Neptune Collange. He didn't know he'd won it and he hit the line. It's no wonder. No, yeah, and I'm always pleased to see a repeat of that race because Time Form's top-rated Sunny Hill Boy at uh, 16 or 18 to 1 was the horse who got collared on the line. But um, 
Yeah, it was a, that is the closest finish in, in the Nationals history. Well, officially, it's the closest finish. It was a head with uh, Tiger Roll beating Pleasant Company. It was a nose, uh, Neptune Collonge, just pipping a... Uh, Sunil Strive flared nostril, won him the race. Uh, a, a huge, exciting finish. And yeah, after, after four and a half, four and a quarter miles, it gets as close as that. And uh, it just shows it, sort of, it can go right down to the wire. It's a race littered three with landmark wins, things that you will never forget. Alden 80, 81, which is an obvious one. Can we just go back to the photo finish? Sorry. I of course we can. I forgot to bring on the, in, the, in the years. The first photo finish uh, in Grand National history was actually in 74. And it was for second place. It was between Lascargo and Charles Dickens. That's the first time they'd ever used the technology. The 1938 Grand National uh, featured a, a very tight finish between an American horse called Battleship. That's a landmark winner. Battleship uh, held on to win the race. Um, but the judge was stood on the line. He had one go at it with the naked eye of calling the winner. To compound matters, the two horses, Battleship and Royal Danielli, they were racing wide apart across the, the loose horse in between them. And he, he gave the verdict to Battleship. The connections of Royal Danelli were, to their dying day, thought they should have won the race with no photo finish. It's inconclusive when you see it on the old British Pathé news because obviously sort of the angles are weird. But that, that was in the days before the photo finish was you know, in use with official technology. That's definitely the most contentious finish in, in national history. Fascinating. Now, we, I meant to touch upon Alden Eaty. There's Don't Push It. There's Manila Times with Rachel Blackmore. Don't Push It, McCoy. We have had those days at Aintree that will, that will never fade. No, and this is where it's sort of... Those type of wins is where you've, you're getting genuine front page headlines as, a, as, as well as back page headlines. Alden Eaty and Bob Champion... It was helped by the fact he was a fancied runner. He was second or third favourite. And Bob Champion's story was sort of well known before the race. He won it hugely emotional, obviously beating cancer in the days when that tended not to happen. Uh, you know, fortunately, survival rates are much better now. And poor old Alden Eaty, he was a good horse. He'd been placed in a Gold Cup, placed in a Hennessy, placed in a Scottish National, but he'd had two or three serious injuries. And he'd come back from a serious severe setback which in most cases probably would have evolved with him you know not just his career ending he's probably his life ending but they, they had very very loyal owners and they, they brought him back and they promised Bob Champion the ride hugely emotional win you got a feature film out of it you've got the Bob it's Champion a great film, film as well yeah no, you know it was a successful film and that really did sort of touch it and then more recently you've had the sort of historic win for Tony McCoy um, who was dominating the sport he was going into that race he was the 14 time champion jockey he ended up being a 20 time champion jockey but really to the sort of general public him winning that race it just took him to another level uh you know he won the sports personality of the year that year that wouldn't have happened if he'd have just won you know just won the title without the grand national win and he just sort of brought him people realized guy this is a this is a proper sporting phenomenon but it needed the Grand National to sort of push him, tip him over the edge into the, the wider public. And then, of course, just more recently, uh, sadly, there was no crowd there to watch it because of COVID. But 2021, Rachel Blackmore, just a genuine good news story. You know, Shades of National Velvet. National Velvet was another film to do with the Grand National. You know, how many sporting events get Hollywood blockbusters made out? And certainly, you know, sporting events from another country. Uh, and it all played into the narrative of that. And she's just a very classy individual, classy jockey, and it was just a genuine good news story. Fully enough, though, I mean, it just shows how that dominated everything. The, the one guy who got overlooked at that was Henry de Bromhead. I mean, he trained the first two in that. He trained the champion hurdle winner, the queen of the champion chase, and the gold cup winner, all that same spring. And he had a one-two in the gold cup as well. And yet it was all about Rachel, obviously. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be there that day. I'll never forget Manila Times. Grand National, freaky Grand Nationals. We've had a few. We've had Foyne, we've had voiced races. There's always been some drama around entry. Well, yeah, the purists might not like them, but I think it, it really helps build into the legends, these sort of the, the, the freaky races. And Foyne Avon's the, 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 the really the place to start because he, he kind of was a genuine no-hoper. I mean, there were, there were high hopes from Young in his career because he was probably well known. He was... He was formerly owned by Arkell's owner. She bought three horses at the same time and she named them all after neighbouring mountains in a, in, in a holiday home in the Scottish Highlands. And one mountain's Ben Stack, another mountain's Arkell, and the one next to it is Foyne Avon. Ben Stack and Arkell obviously went on to be uh, Cheltenham Festival winners. Arkell, probably the best chaser we've ever seen. Foyne Avon proved to be a bit of a dud. Uh, he got sold on. And he qualified for the national because he'd won a race when he was trained in Ireland. But he, he joined Connections, who, if you were sort of 
modern day, it'd be more like Fergus Wil Wilson type horses who, who sort of were ambitiously campaigned, shall we say. And he'd run in the King George that year as a no hope, he'd run in the champion uh, in the Cheltenham Gold Cup. So he turned up at Aintree, 100 to one shot, and he was minding his own business in rear when carnage ensued at the 23rd. Two loose horses wiped out the whole field. Foynaven, there was one other horse who actually jumped it as well, but he was tailed off. But Foynaven was effectively the only horse to jump it without sort of having several goes at it. Found himself way clear and, um, you know, held on for an improbable win. The fence, the 23rd, is named after him now. Uh, and yeah, definitely, uh, it's it sort of gone down in sp sporting folklore as the luckiest winner. And in terms of that Void National, there's no SNS fence named after him. But that, no. that was amazing. We watched the drama unfold on the TV, the BBC at the time. We just, oh, just couldn't believe what you were seeing. It was, an, it was a nightmare, wasn't it? It was... Um, you couldn't believe it was happening, and sadly, it did look very amateurish, didn't it? It looked, you know, knicker elastic to sort of repair the tape because there was there'd been one false start, and then the second the second attempt was even worse. But on the second attempt, they they got the uh, the recall uh, procedure completely wrong. So two thirds, three quarters of the field carried on. About nine nine or ten had pulled up. Then when they came around the circuit, about another half sort of pulled up they'd often from just people by the side of the course said it's a, it's a false start and about nine or ten carried on and SNS was one of them and uh, yeah just a complete disaster it wasn't rescheduled sadly uh, you know uh, rightly or wrongly it wasn't rescheduled and uh, not a great day in the in the history of the, uh, of, of the national but it sort of all added to it you know the sort of it was memorable put it like that I'm going to touch on number five, last but not least, hard luck stories. Sport is synonymous with hard luck stories, but I defy anybody to find a bigger than one, bigger one than Devon Lock in 1956. Yeah, so well, that's it's that's it's become sort of part of the national vocabulary. The De if you even now people kind of know what a Devon Lock moment is instead of grabbing defeat from victory's jaws. And uh, it, I mean, we say freaky. It was freaky. Why did it happen? Obviously, it was clear on the run-in. There's so many theories as to, as, to, as to why it happened. Was it a phantom jump because he was just passing the water jump? Dick Francis has always sworn that it was... Um, he pricked his ears up probably because he saw the water jump and the noise coming just suddenly overtook him and that's why, in shock, he sort of did that. Tommy Stack, when he won Red Rum's third Grand National, but was absolutely taken aback by the blast of noise when he sort of hit the run-in. And if you ever watched that race, that's the reason he said he pushed him out the whole way to the line because he, he was fearful of something similar happening. So that might have been it, but judging by the people who rode against Devon Locke, they think it would be a bit like a marathon runner hitting the wall or sort of like uh, lactic acid or whatever, just going because uh, the, the jockey who rode the eventual winner, Dave Dick, said he looked at him at the second last and Devon Locke's uh, tongue was black. And apparently in one of his later runs the following season, he did something similar behind the stands at Sandown where he just lost his le legs, yeah, and managed to, and was fine with him when about 20 seconds later. Um, so a bizarre incident, you know, who knows what really happened, but, uh, you know, he was going to win the race and it, obviously it was the royal horse. Uh, it couldn't have been the more high profile horse for it to happen to. And uh, yeah, you know, a, a big who done it. Phil, we could talk for hours about the Grand National History. It's absolutely fascinating. That's, in 15 minutes, five reasons why the Randolph's Grand National is so special. And let's hope something happens at Aintree this year that makes the list next time we're talking to Phil.